Welcome to How's Your E-Presence on Business Radio X. This show is produced by E-Presence, and I am Mark Galvin, the founder and president of that agency. We are coming to you live from the Subaru of Gwinnett Studio inside the Sonesta Gwinnett Place Atlanta Hotel. And we're glad you're here with us. It is a rainy day in Atlanta. Traffic is thick out there, and uh, our our show producer Mike Salmon has promised us that we are uh, we're, we're I think we're actually on regular like regular radio, so everybody on eighty five can listen to us. We're going to talk a lot about social media today because that's what we do here on How's Your E Presence. This show is brought to you by E Presence, and uh, we are a firm that manages social media for both companies and individuals. So every month. We love to send out questions or, or host questions from our, our our listening audience, and I've got a couple of new questions. And if you're ever interested in sending in a question, all you got to do is send it to me at my universal handle. It's E Presence M G. That's E Presence M for Mark, G for Galvin, and that's my handle everywhere. So here's the first question I have that uh, that is good for this month. Is this is from Marlon Rhine? Marlon is a personal injury attorney at the Rhine Law Firm, and he sent this great question: Is it wise to place a link to an article in the comments on LinkedIn, and why? So evidently, Marlon has seen a post show up on LinkedIn recently where someone was doing that. And um, I want to tell you what, Marlon, you ask a great question because, yes, it is good to place the link to an article in the comments on LinkedIn. So I'm going to let's let's flesh this out just a tiny bit more. Let's say I found a great article on the Atlanta Journal-Constitution. I could go in. I can take the, the link to that article and I can drop it in LinkedIn. Well, don't do that. Talk about the article, maybe grab a photo of the article, but drop the link to the post or to that actual article in the comments after you post. You'll reach more people. If you want more on that, ping me, and I'd be happy to answer some of those questions for you. One more question that we have is from Beth Boswell. Beth Boswell is with Boswell Real Estate. I think they're here in Atlanta, as a matter of fact. Her question is, is... Um, is it worthwhile for real estate professionals to use LinkedIn? Well, here's the deal. You need to figure out where your audience is on social media. If it is on Facebook, you should be on Facebook. If it is on Twitter, you should go to Twitter. If it's on Snapchat, you're looking for a 17 year old, 18 year old, you go to Snapchat. If your audience as a real estate professional is on LinkedIn, you should, you should be there. Now I'm going to urge you to think about something and that is there are not a lot of real estate agents on LinkedIn really leveraging it. And I'll guarantee you, everyone that these real estate professionals want to talk to are on LinkedIn. So they may not be used to hearing you there. So it, it might be worthwhile to jump in there and touch and, and reach those uh, those folks that are your connections, connect with all of your potential um, um, clients. And I think you may find you could influence them. So the answer to the question is yes, I think it is worthwhile for a real estate professional to be on LinkedIn. Well, enough about those questions. Thank you so much for submitting those, uh, Marlon and Beth. We appreciate that. Uh, I want to get on to today's guest. Today's guest is uh, Zachary Knight with Knight Protection Services. And uh, Zachary, you don't go by Zach. Do you go by Zachary? Is that right? Only when I'm in trouble, I go by Zach, unless I'm getting yelled at by my mom or my wife. Oh my goodness! Well, you you have such a deep voice. I I, I would be I'm assuming that they're probably going to run from you. You do you, do you get deeper when you're making a point? I try to, but then <laughs> my wife knows how to put me in my place very well. Well, that's so. good stuff. Well, that's fantastic. Well, thanks for being here. Your organization is Night Protection Services. Tell me what. Tell me what you guys do. So we perform security audits for corporations and residential level um, buildings. So that can be from a homeowner all the way up to a business owner. And we essentially audit what's in place and what needs to be implemented to improve safety, security, and protection for your home or your business in a safe work environment. Today, I'm sure a lot of people are concerned about security. That seems to be a common thread around. So I would think that you have a few people knocking on your door. And some people probably call you too late after they've had some sort of security issue. Well, I'm going to read some bio stuff here because there's some cool things that, uh, that I noticed about you. You are currently an infantry lieutenant and platoon leader in the U.S. Army 
Georgia National Guard. So does that mean that you could de- – can you get deployed when you're in the National Guard? So I actually just got back from Afghanistan in August, so I had that Jeez. combat deployment. All right. um, and then we're on the docket to go again in 2022. We go every four years. And then in the Army, you, you got extensive training in risk assessment and mitigation techniques. Is that right? Yes. What is That, that sounds very impressive. What does that mean? So it's the same thing that I do um, – that background develops perfectly into what I do with my business, where we focus on assessing risks. Um, think a business SWOT analysis, but for security. So we do security SWOT analysis and then dive deeper with the audit where we look at strengths, weaknesses, opportunities for crime or liability, and then threats, just like a SWOT analysis. And then we just relate it all back to security measures and how to improve upon those through safer, more secure cultures, policies, procedures, so on and so forth. So, you know, you know, here on the radio, you sound like a badass. You sound like you're the guy that I want running my security. That's you know, good. Doing That's good. My, I'm, t- I'm just telling you, man. Here, listening to you, I mean, I know you pretty well. Uh, and you do, you know, I, I don't think I'd want to take you on one-on-one. Uh, with, with I'm a every- teddy bear. A, <laughs> I really am. But uh, – but what you've done and the, the history you have makes total sense that you would get into protection services. Now, my audience is out there saying, okay, great, Mark. This is a social media show. You got a guy that has been in the Army's National Guard, extensive training in risk assessments and mitigation techniques. Well, folks, you need to hang on for the second half of the meeting or our show here because he has some really cool things that he's doing on social media, and I can't wait to share that with you. Zach, if you're okay with it, we're going to talk about some current things that are going on in social media. Absolutely. And I want you to weigh in. There's a little political bent here, and typically we try to stay away from politics, but I think there's a, this political bent is a little interesting. Um, so I'm not sure if you heard about this. The Wall Street Journal covered this. Um, uh, Mayor Bloomberg is paying staffers to promote his campaign on their personal social media for $2,500 a month. Now, I want to flesh this out a bit. I heard this in the news. And I heard that he was paying people to promote his social media or promote him on their social media. And I thought it was influencers. No, 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 that's not the case. He's got a gazillion staffers, evidently, right? He's, they're all over the country. He's spending a boatload of money on running this campaign because he has a boatload of money. And so what he's done is, is to give his staff and thousands of them an incentive. He's saying, if you talk about me on your social media, I'm going to pay you $2,500 extra a month. Okay, now what, here's what's fascinating. This is upsetting a lot of people out there. Um, this is, and the reason is, is are these folks actually saying, hey, I work on the campaign and so I'm influenced? And the question is, is that good or is that bad? What do you think? I'm just curious. What do you think about that? Oh, I think it's brilliant because nobody else is doing it. <laughs> You're a marketer. I yeah, love absolutely. That. It's right. brilliant. I mean, when nobody else is doing something like that, it's not violating any ethics. It's no different than paying for a biz dev person or a marketing agency to go out and do it. They're already on staff. They're just being compensated for spending their time on social media marketing for him. I think it's a genius idea. Even though they're doing it on their own personal social media saying, hey, vote for Zachary, right? If I was on your team and you'd say, hey, Mark, if you talk about me on your social media, I'll pay you 2500 bucks a month. I would do that for the record. <laughs> if you paid me 2500 bucks a month, I'd put on my social media. Um, but see, what's fascinating, and, and I think that there's a line here, and this is important, and I will tell you, I don't have a problem with it, but I do think that the folks should put on a disclaimer that they are part of the campaign staff. I do think they should have that on their profile. And that's all I need to do. Go in your profile, current position, uh, working in the campaign for for Mike Bloomberg. Outside of that, they can do whatever they want. And and this is, there are influencers, and this kind of borderlines into that. It kind of nudges its way into what is the responsibility of an influencer to say, I'm endorsing this bottle of water, and I'm getting paid for it. There's a, there is a question of ethics there because that person wouldn't talk about that bottle of water unless they were being paid to put that on their social media. And I think that that should be there. So uh, this is interesting. I think we're going to find some things come out of this. And the FEC, the Federal Elections uh, Commission, will probably end up looking at this. But Facebook has said that they don't. This doesn't break any agreement. This is not in violation of their 
uh, terms and conditions. So if you're interested in this, folks, you want to see more, the Wall Street Journal article is interesting. It's a lot more in depth. I'll drop the link to that in our show notes. So take a look for that if you want more. But, uh, you know, interesting food for thought. And I agree with you. When it comes to marketing like this, it's a great idea. We want to do this with all of our team members. Absolutely. We want them to talk about the company. So they're kind of doing that, right. talking about the company. So cool. I'm going to move on. Uh, we could talk about that one for 30 minutes. Uh, Forbes dropped something new. This is kind of interesting. Um, on their, what's a CRM? A CRM is a customer relationship management tool. And I think my audience knows what it is, but I still said that. LinkedIn is taking another big step towards integrating with your CRM. This is a pretty cool thing. So they've re- recently announced some some improvements, and I'm going to read this. This is quote. Recently, the company announced new enhancements to Sales Navigator tool, which promises to boost pipeline quality and increase sales and marketing efficiencies, end quote. Here's what the deal is. They're they're integrating. So now you can go into your CRM and you can pull the data. So, Zachary, you're you're a contact of mine in my CRM. My CRM will look in LinkedIn and make sure it's pooling your most current data into the CRM. Not a bad thing, I don't think. I think that's a good thing. Here's the deal. Number one, you gotta, you're you going to have to have Salesforce or Microsoft, uh, Microsoft Dynamics for this. And, of course, Microsoft owns LinkedIn. I'm actually curious that Salesforce is there, but I'm sure Salesforce is paying some money for this. And you have to be on LinkedIn Sales Navigator. So that, uh, that cost for that is between $65 and $135 a month. If you're working LinkedIn as a as a lead gen tool, you need to be on Sales Navigator. It is a robust system that help you find new people. I'm, I'm getting pummeled on my LinkedIn profile lately with all these new leads of people asking me to, they want to do marketing for me. And I think a lot of that's coming through the Sales Navigator system that they have. But anyway, the long and short of it is, I think this is good. I like that this is this is being rolled out. And the big reason that I like this is because I want more people on LinkedIn. I want more people to know what's going, what's the data points that are showing up on LinkedIn to help them communicate better, to help them understand their clients better. I think that that's the good thing that LinkedIn offers. So I'm going to drop a link on this also. This is a, a link to the Forbes article. There's a lot of great info there, and this is the future. If you think about it, LinkedIn is kind of one big CRM system. I call it a big database, and it is, in fact, that. But this will help all of us maybe do a little better job, especially if we're on Dynamics or Salesforce. All right, Zachary, here we go. Let's let's shift over to you. i got some questions for you. Number one is, here's why I wanted you on the show. You and your wife, as a matter of fact, are working on podcasts. So your wife has her own property, has her own podcast that she's mm-hmm. that she's already launched. Is, Correct. is that right? Yep. And you've seen some great success with that. And your success is running parallel to the way you're leveraging that on on uh, social media. Share with our audience how you guys have done this, and give me some analytical results if you don't mind. Of course. How, how's the because you haven't launched your podcast yet? Last week. Oh, you did? And went live last week. Okay. So share with our audience what you did and what success you've seen, if you wouldn't mind. So a big part of it, her her podcast is very passion and mission-driven. It correlates the same name as our nonprofit, Surviving to Thriving, which is a domestic violence support nonprofit. And her mission on the podcast is to either interview individuals that have gone through some sort of abuse and want to share their story or industry experts that can provide some sort of resource to them. So Mindset, you came onto the podcast to talk about LinkedIn and how important it is to have an online resume for people that may have never built that. Thank you for letting me be a guest. I enjoyed that. It was a fantastic episode, and that's where we've used LinkedIn to prospect for people like that all across the country. It's only improving our reach when we find somebody in Las Vegas that is a psychologist that focuses on overcoming trauma and we bring her on the, or him on the podcast, and now our reach is then shared in Las Vegas. So we use it as cool. a prospecting tool to find different guests for the show. That's interesting. So you're using the guests to expand your reach because 
you're leveraging their audience. Correct. Right. I talk a little bit. There's something similar that I do on LinkedIn, and I have a team of people that work with, well, not work with me, that are friends of mine. They have a lot of connections on LinkedIn. And when there's a post that I want to reach a lot more people, I'll ask them if they'll share that. An engagement group. Yes, essentially. It's exactly right. Yep. And actually, sharing is the wrong word on LinkedIn. Don't share. Like or comment mm-hmm. is what you should do on LinkedIn. And you're doing the same thing. You're bringing on these audience member, these guests, and they're, of course, going to push your content to their audience. So it's very, very smart. Do you help them with that? Or do these folks that you're bringing on, are they savvy enough to do it on their own? So we usually send them whatever marketing material we create. So if that's a the episode cover art, each episode gets its own cover art and has their fo- their photo on it as long as well as the topic we're discussing. So it kind of highlights their expertise. We send that over to them the weekend before and say, hey, this is what's coming up. Make sure you share, so on and so forth. Sweet. We provide the link nice. um, to the podcast episode itself. That way it's just quick and easy for them to share that and there's – not, so far, not been any hesitation on that where we're getting good feedback. So the art sounds daunting. How are you doing that? I am a huge believer in paying somebody else to do things you're not good at. <laughs> <laughs> and I paid somebody to create a template for us on okay. Canva, if you use Canva. Sure, sure. Um, they created a template for us, and we just switch out photos and text, and good to go. I'm hoping – I was hoping you were going to say Canva. Canva is a fantastic place. It's amazing. It is. It's, it does great work. And it's super, super easy to use. So, well done. Uh, Mike Salmon, the owner of this radio station, does this. You'll get this at the end of the show. He will get. He will send you an email, and he'll say on the email, Here's all, here are the ways that you can leverage this show. Helps you reach more people, and it helps you share the value of Business Radio X to your audience members. So it expands his audience well. Very smart. I love that you're doing that, and it's brilliant. Have you... How many listeners are you getting? I should probably ask about your wife's podcast, yes. unless your your podcast is, is blowing up. My numbers are not there yet. Okay. Um, they take a few episodes to actually process everything, and I'm, I've already aired three episodes. Yep, um, doing three episodes a week, and but hers is just one a week right now. She's getting about 500 downloads an episode, and I think a That's lot good. of that is very mission driven. Sure, but they say the average podcast gets 80. Yep. Um, a really good one gets over a thousand. So right. her being halfway there and. We just launched beginning of January. It's pretty impressive with what she's doing. That is good. What work did you do before you launched the podcast? I am very much a mass action type of guy. So when we came up with the idea for her podcast and same thing I did with mine, we came up with the concept and we started recording interviews immediately. You kind of flesh it out as we went. I think any action is better than no action. Imperfect action is better than no action. I like that. So I came up with the concept of my podcast, and two weeks later it went live. With hers, about a month, but we both batched about four months' worth of content before we published the first episode. Good. So that way there's a good backlog of everything to come through. So that really works well when the show host is stuck on I-85 in the rain because they didn't oh, – oh, I, I, lose, like I, lost my, I lost my train of thought <laughs> just there for a moment. Well, good. Um, let's see. I've got some other questions here for you. This is This is awesome. So – how, what has been your biggest lesson that you've found so far in business? That if, when you're sitting down and you're talking to someone who's going to start doing what you're doing, I'll let you define what you're doing. What would you tell that person to make sure they don't do? Don't do this. Everything. Don't do everything yourself. And that was a very difficult part as an entrepreneur. Coming out of the government, you're not taught how to run a business. No. Um, I've been yeah. smart enough to go back and I just completed my MBA. Um, so that should be being conferred here shortly. So I learned more about business. But one thing I learned throughout all that, there's so much from social media. I'm not a an artistic creative. So creating episode art or creating a website is not my wheelhouse. Right. I had a self-created GoDaddy website for the first year of business and it looked like a uh, Pittsburgh Steelers fan page black and gold and that is not (laughs) anything what my logo looks like just the colors were awful so I would highly recommend find people within your network or ask around find somebody that's a specialist in that piece same with our podcast we record and then dropbox it and we have a production team that does all the editing for it and then post it to iTunes so if you can do that always do that so that's a great tip i 
I record my own podcast outside of uh, outside of this studio. Here it's great. It's turnkey. Mike does a great job with it. When I do it on my own, I record it through Zoom. Mm-hmm. And I think you guys Same do here. through yep. Zoom. And it'll go to a share drive, and I have two people on my team that take it from there. And they just know where it goes because I'll just send them a text. It's done. Mm-hmm. And they'll take it from there. I just don't have enough time, nor the bandwidth, nor the – it's not a – it's it's valuable time. I have to be careful. I say this. It's valuable time doing that, but my time's better served doing something else. Well, when you look at it, um, especially with what I do, I might charge two hundred dollars an hour for my time if I'm consulting, but it might I might pay somebody fifty dollars an hour to do all the editing, right? Or less than that, realistically, you know, ten twenty dollars an hour to do the editing. So where's your time best spent? Like you just said, if you're right. a businessman, you don't want to do a ten dollar an hour activity when you could be making two hundred an hour. Well, I need to be working to that two hundred dollars an hour every single moment. I'm not making that money, right? That is, that's a that's better use uh, of my time, and that's something we all know about. Uh, one of the things that I found is interesting is that I know a lot of people who do a website for twenty thousand dollars. I do. I know a lot of people, and they'll do them really well, mm-hmm. really well. You know, code conspirators, colleagues of mine, come to mind. But you, you do need to know that there are people out there who can help you with a website, do it for a lot less money. You're not going to get all the bells and whistles, but there are folks out there. You just got to knock on enough doors, ask, the, ask enough people, network, and you can find someone who can help you at a lower price point, give you a decent product. The big thing is, and this is not really social media, but it is still digital marketing, build your website on, um, on WordPress. That's my one urging that Absolutely. everyone out there. Absolutely. You know, get on WordPress as soon as you can because it's much more portable and you can take one website and move it to someone else and they can help build that. If you're on Wix, and I'm not, and I start off on Wix, right? I have no problem with that website. Know that you can't take that website with you. So if it's possible, if it is possible, put it on a WordPress site first. And one note on that about websites, I personally think social media is a much better place to be building content. A website should just be essentially a landing page, but how many people actually go to your website that also hire you? They'll find you on Google, they'll find you on Facebook, they find you on Google, then they go to Facebook, then they go back to Google, and then they go to your Instagram or LinkedIn. Nowhere in there does it say we go to your website. That's like seven or eight steps down when they're actually searching you in the analytics of it all. So go for an imperfect website yep. and then just kill social media. So I, I agree with you and I disagree. And here's the word I disagree with, this is good is because you're going to show up higher on Google if you have a decent website. Very true. So that's the tough thing. But I do think that you're right. As I pull up somebody on Google and I see them, I'm probably going to end up on me. I'm going to end up on social media. In fact, mm-hmm. I'm probably going to go to Facebook or LinkedIn and look, to, look them up first. Yep. But I'm still looking at that Google component to see where they are. Maybe there's And there is a geographic piece. If I'm in mm-hmm. Atlanta, I'm going to get Atlanta businesses. So it's important that you have your brick-and-mortar address if you have one. Right. And the Google, my, helps. the Google My Business profile. It's huge. Huge. So and important. I didn't even learn about it until I got back from the deployment um, last fall. And that's been one of the biggest catalysts is creating that profile to mirror social media. I think it's a huge aspect as well. It's big. So you've done some live video and some other content creation on your social media. Share with our audience what you've done. So I essentially do how-to videos, um, what I do, and then I provide scenarios. So all my videos kind of are educational, where what I do is kind of abstract, but also a very niche market. So it takes a lot to educate a client before they ever purchase from me, very long sales cycle. So all my video content has been toward that where I talk about a a what if Wednesday that just got rebranded for my podcast to the situation room where I provide a great name. um, I do a scenario about here's a business issue. I answer it. And then whoever I interviewed on Monday comes back on on Friday and answers it from their business expertise level. So it's providing education on here's how we can help a business owner, help an entrepreneur, help somebody that's struggling with leadership or whatever their issue is. So it's providing more of that actionable value yep. right off the rip, which I think is a huge piece of any social media marketing that you're doing. That's brilliant. Video is everything. I've talked to my clients constantly about doing video, so much so that I started pushing out some of my own videos lately more and more often because it's so important, and it's great that you're doing that. All right, Zach, how can people track you down? Where are you? 
So you can find Night Protection at Night Pro LLC. That's K N I G H T Pro LLC across every social media platform. And then my podcast is at Be a Tactical Leader across all social media, and it's Tactical Leadership as the podcast. Awesome. So um, you drop a podcast every week? Three days. Uh, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. So three episodes a week. Three a week? Yes. Holy moly. How long are they? Um, the interviews usually run about 45 minutes. Okay. The situation room is just a solo cast. It usually runs 20-ish minutes. And then the Friday episode, I haven't come up with a good catchy name for it, but the Tactical Friday episode usually runs another 20 minutes or so where it's a good conversation about that scenario. Okay, if somebody came up with a real catchy name for your Friday episode, would you give them a free consulting session? Free consulting, a good shout-out on it, absolutely. We can figure something out. <laughs> All right. Well, there's your challenge, folks. Help help him out. Zach needs somebody – Zachary needs someone to help him <laughs> out with – his uh, his show on Friday, but that's a ton of content. So you're you're busy doing that, and it's it's going to help you create such a strong brand that folks are going to easily know this is somebody that I want to do business with. Because you're you, you described your business as it's not tangible, and it really is branded about who you are. And you're interested in doing some public speaking also. So if mm -hmm. a group wanted to come in and see who you are, they could come in and, and see your videos or right. listen to your podcast. For that well uh zachary thanks for being here man it's oh i always, appreciate it man it's this always a fun. pleasure I, I appreciate you coming out and i want to thank all of you for joining us here on how's your e-presence in 2020 we decided that we're going to do a little better job of sharing what e-presence has to offer so what is that first we can help the solopreneur or the ceo with their personal social media with their entire team the executive team will clean up the entire c-suite and then uh, those folks, why do we do that? It's because those folks represent the brand more than anyone else. Second, we can drive company social media. So, you know, pick a picture of the, the local restaurant. They need to be on social media. We can drive that for them to help them increase their own engagement and ROI. Finally, we also help college students. Uh, think about this, folks. If you've, you're looking for a great uh, college graduation gift, this is a great one. We help people polish their resume. We do con we do mock interviews, and we clean up their LinkedIn profile. They understand Snapchat, but they don't understand LinkedIn. We can help them with that. If you're interested in any of our offerings as a How's Your, How's Your E-Presence listener, you automatically get 5% off on all of our services. Grab that discount right at epresence.me slash How's Your E-Presence epresence.me slash how's your epresence or give us a call 404-939-8094 you can also track that down on the website tell us you're calling about the podcast and you'll be able to take advantage of that five percent discount so if you're an entrepreneur big executive law firm college student we have a solution for you it helps you it doesn't work against you i look forward to hearing from you now Back to the show. We here always here on the third Thursday at three at Business Radio X. You can always listen to a show live by selecting businessradiox.com and selecting the Gwinnett Studio. Also find how's your e-presence on all major podcast channels, iTunes, Google Play, SoundCloud, Spotify, even your Amazon Echo. We add content every week so you can stay up to date on all business and social media. Be sure to add us to your podcast app, or you can always visit our website at epresence.me to catch all of our shows. Until next time, for my guest, Zachary Knight, I'm Mark Galvin, and this has been How's Your Epresence on Business Radio X. Music.